In this video, we're going to take a look at the intersection between nonverbal communication and listening, specifically the skill of listening and active listening. So um, first of all, we this takes place as part of our discussion of the hurrier model of listening. That's H-U-R-I-E-R, -E which stands for hearing, understanding, remembering, interpreting, evaluating, and responding. And specifically right now, we are in the interpreting area of the hurrier model discussing that. So we're going to lay in nonverbal in interpreting and talk about the factor that it plays and the role that it plays in interpreting things as a listener. So interpreting, as you may recall, falls in, as far as the hurrier model falls in this area of understanding, interpreting, evaluating, and really just that process of, of processing what it is we're hearing and trying to come to some um, understanding and, and common um, shared um, understanding of what is being communicated um, with, the, with the person who's speaking as the listener. So that's where interpreting falls in there and nonverbal then. We're going to talk about that as an aspect of interpreting. We've talked about some other factors in interpreting, like shared understanding, frame of reference, and emotional intelligence. So again, now we're going to get into the nonverbal elements in that process. So nonverbal communication, just to review the definition here real quickly, is the process of sending and receiving messages without using words, either spoken or written. So anytime we have an actual word, uh, you know, the symbolic representation of the, of these, these characters we put together as a word, whether it's spoken or it's written, that's not nonverbal. That's verbal communication. So uh, nonverbal communication, though, is everything else. And we'll talk about some of the different channels of nonverbal communication. But but when we have the word itself, either spoken or written, that's verbal communication. What we're talking about is, you know, all the other parts of outgoing communication, really. So a couple of things to understand about the nature of nonverbal communication, some foundational aspects of nonverbal communication. First, we need to recognize that all behavior has communicative value. Uh, as Paul Watzlawick put it, com communication researcher Paul Watzlawick put it, you cannot not communicate. Everything you do or don't do, everything you say or don't say has communicative value. So it's not just words and language that have these this communicative value as, in, in terms of verbal communication. But nonverbal communica communication also has tremendous communicative value and communicates a lot. We're very expressive using nonverbal communication, especially when it comes to um, the relational aspect, because uh, as we're going to learn here right now, nonverbal communication is primarily relational. Right. If I said, OK, lay out your case for why or for, for who is the better general in, at the conclusion of the uh, U.S. Civil War? Was it Ulysses S. Grant or Robert E. Lee? Who was the better general throughout that period? Lay out your case, but do it non-verbally. Can't use verbal communication. Remember, verbal communication includes sign language. Um, so you can't use sign language. Some people want to get around it by that. But, you know, we don't really do that. That's not how we that's not how we use nonverbal communication. It's primarily relational. Um, if I asked you to tell me how you feel about these generals or something that you might be able to do that using nonverbal communication, certainly more easily than you could give me facts about about their names or their birth dates or the major battles that they participated in. We don't use nonverbal communication to relay factual information. We use it to communicate relational information, how we feel about that message, how we feel about that person or whatever it is we're talking about. Nonverbal communication is ambiguous. It's ambiguous. It's oftentimes vague. It can be interpreted in a variety of ways. So we need, as we focus on interpretation here as a part of the listening process, we need to remember that nonverbal communication itself is ambiguous. So if I said, tell me what facial expression um, this person is using, tell me what they're trying to express with this. Now, a couple of them we might be able to identify a fairly um, effective, you know, expression that would be attached to that, emotion that would be attached to that. But some of these are much more vague. We could come at it from a lot of different directions because nonverbal communication is ambiguous. It's really hard to, to pin down specifically a lot of times. So we, we need to bear that in mind that it is ambiguous. Nonverbal communication does occur in what we call mediated messages. So messages that use some sort of technology as an intermediary. We, we see nonverbal communication occurring in those. A lot of times we'll, we'll see it through, you know, with we'll use things like all caps means that somebody's shouting, right? That's an expression of nonverbal communication, even though it's not technically nonverbal. It still has to do with just the words themselves. But, but we've come to the shared understanding of the fact that if it's all in caps, then it represents shouting, right? Or we use emojis. We started with things just like this, very simple, like using characters on the keyboard to represent a smiley face. And then we got more advanced. We had different kinds of faces that we could express. And now we just have all kinds of things, right? And my favorite is the ice cream, but, but we can communicate non-verbally through these mediated messages through using these different techniques that we've agreed upon. 
Nonverbal communication is absolutely affected by culture and gender. What, what represents, again, nonverbal communication is ambiguous. So what a, a, a uh, nonverbal uh, symbol may mean in one culture is not necessarily the same as in another. And it could be very something very um, innocuous in one culture and mean something completely different in a different culture. So we need to be aware of that, that just like language, nonverbal communication changes from culture to culture. So it's not universal. There are a few functions of nonverbal communication. And just real quickly, we use nonverbal communication for a lot of different things, including creating and maintaining relationships. We use it to regulate information or interaction to determine, you know, whose turn is it to talk? Essentially, so we regulate interaction through nonverbal communication. We use it to influence others, sometimes sweetly and positively, sometimes through intimidation. Right? We use it for concealing and deceiving others, concealing information and deceiving other people. And we use it to manage impressions. We spend a lot of time thinking about nonverbally what we're communicating, how we're dressed, how we smell, what we look like, what our tone of voice is to manage impressions with others. So we use nonverbal communication for a lot of different things. We also use nonverbal communication in a lot of different ways. So let's chat about some of the different channels of nonverbal communication that we have. <coughs> Excuse me. Starting with our body movement, our kinesics. There are a variety of different kind of categories uh, that we place under body movement in nonverbal communication, starting with our facial displays. Our face is very expressive, and, and we use it a lot in communication to identify what a person is feeling, how they feel about that message, all those different types of things, right? We, we, we depend a lot on facial expression, so our facial displays enhance our communication a lot through nonverbal communication. Our eye behaviors, our oculesics, as it's called, our, our, our eye behaviors uh, indicate you know, a lot of time we take, we interpret again, to get back to interpretation, there are different interpretations for these things, but in our culture specifically, we interpret eye contact. If somebody's maintaining eye contact, we, we associate that with truthfulness. We associate that with somebody paying attention to us. Um, in other cultures, too much eye contact could be a signal of trying to dominate somebody else, right? Or trying to express dominance over somebody else. That's very common in the animal kingdom. It's very common in different, uh, especially collectivistic cultures too. That's why eye contact is different from culture to culture. But regardless of how we use it, we use eye behaviors to interpret a lot and, and make meaning of a message in a lot of different ways. Our posture, just how we're standing and how, or how we're sitting as we communicate indicates a lot about uh, us, about the message and how we feel about it. And we use it a lot to, to express ourselves nonverbally. And of course, our gestures, how we use our hands and our arms. Some people talk a lot with their hands. Some people don't. That's fine. It's not that there's a better or worse type of thing, but, but we use gestures in a lot of different ways to communicate nonverbally. So all of these have to do with our body and our kinesics. So we, we, um, throw them in under body movement, but they're all very important specific channels of nonverbal communication. Another is touch or what we call haptics. Uh, haptics, again, just have to do with touch. We use touch in a lot of different ways to communicate nonverbally. Sometimes it's a comforting touch like this, right? Or to express affection or caring for someone else. Sometimes it's more of a clinical touch, like what you have at the doctor's office when they're, when they're examining a particular area. If you're, you know, when they're, when they're touching your, checking your lymph nodes in your throat or whatever, and they're touching you here, or they're, they're touching your chest to, to, to check your breathing and things like that, or whatever it is they're doing, that's more of a clinical touch. But we communicate non-verbally a lot through different ways of touch and avenues that we use touch in a lot of different ways. And again, very culturally bound, different cultures use touch in drastically different ways. So we need to be aware of that. But but in in any case, touch is a very important non-verbal communicator. We do have what we call paralanguage or, or using our voice and elements that are related to that. Now, this is different than verbal communication. Again, we've distinguished that verbal communication has to do with the words that we use, which are very important. But there's also nonverbal elements involved in, for example, how loudly we say those words or how what rate of speech we have and the tone that we're using. Are we monotone or are we using a, you know, a, a lot of different tones in our voice? So. This is all what we call paralanguage or the way that we use our voice to communicate something. And that is nonverbal, okay? not specifically, not specific to the words that we're choosing in that instance, but specific to our use of, of our voice. And that is a nonverbal um, channel. We also think about space or proxemics. Right? Proxemics have to do with uh, how close close we are when we're standing next to somebody, right? Um, or when we're talking to somebody, how close are we? In, in different cultures vary in terms of 
what's considered appropriate personal space or you know those types of things but in general we know that space is a very important nonverbal channel um, for example even just you know if we're, if we're sharing a secret with somebody and we lean and we whisper it in there we get really close when we put our hand up i mean that's a couple different things but we're getting close that indicates hey this is something i only want you to know right i don't want everybody to know this i'm not shouting it from across the room right so we use space in a lot of different ways to express um, what our relationship is to that person and, uh, and and express things about the message itself. So um, proxemics or space is a very important nonverbal communicator. Uh, some additional channels of communication, territoriality, the way we use space around us, the way we protect that space in particular, um, the way we uh, treat that space. This is my desk area or this is, you know, my part of the room and this is my car. We, we stake claims to these types of things and express that nonverbally um, how we use time or chronemics time is a nonverbal communicator are we making people wait for us or are we you know on time or are we you know what message does that send and so time is a is a is a very important nonverbal communicator we also use physical attractiveness again the way that we the way that we look um, as is an important aspect of nonverbal communication and we we do things to enhance that right our physical attractiveness to others or, or not. And that in and of itself, again, can be a nonverbal communicator, things we don't do in that regard. And the clothing that we choose, you know, indicates a lot about what we do. Do we have a uniform for where you work? And are you wearing that? And is there, even if there's no technical uniform, what's the dress code where you work? And what's the dress code at home? And what message do you send by wearing those clothes? And those are all nonverbal communicators. And even things like if you're a fan of a particular sports team, and so you're wearing, or a particular band or whatever, you're wearing the t-shirt or a sweatshirt of that band or sports team, and you're expressing yourself non-verbally, you're expressing your, your fandom, your loyalty to that team or that group or whatever. So our clothing it says a lot about us and does so without necessarily doing so in a verbal way. Our physical environment, how do we keep our house? How do we keep our, our, uh, our um, car, those types of things? How do we, and, and the, uh, the message that that sends to how do we decorate and what does that say about us and how, how cleanly is it? All those types of things. Our physical environment expresses a lot about us non-verbally. And then finally, smell or olfactics is a really critical nonverbal channel. Our smell is, very, for example, very, very closely associated to memory. Uh, but we spend and we spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, how do I smell? I shower. So I use soap that smells a certain way. I use perfume that smells a certain way. I use laundry detergent that smells a certain way because um, our smell sends a particular message about us and is a, is a nonverbal communicator in and of itself. So as you can see, there are lots of different ways that we communicate non-verbally, all these different channels, and then within them, all kinds of different ways that we use them to communicate non-verbally about ourselves. And so as listeners, then we also need to use that to interpret things about others coming the other way. What's the other person dressed like? How do they smell? How are they gesturing? What kind of facial expressions am I picking up as a listener from them? So, so we need to think also about, you know, ways that we interpret nonverbal communication. So just a couple of things here real quickly in terms of interpreting specifically nonverbals. First, be sensitive to those nonverbal messages. Be aware of them and, and also be aware, that, though, that we need to decipher the meaning of them because they can be ambiguous. We need to take into account what's the situation. What's the culture that I'm in and that this other person is a part of? And if need be, do I need to ask for clarification? Because these things are ambiguous at times. So when we're interpreting nonverbal communication, we want to be sure, first of all, that we're paying attention to those things. And secondly, that we are able to then decipher the meaning of those nonverbal messages um, with those different context clues, the situation, the culture, and, and even potentially following up to ask for, for further clarification on these things. So as you can see, nonverbal communication is an essential part of listening because it's not just the words that somebody uses that are important. Those are certainly important. Not only that we be able to hear and understand those words and know what they mean and then decipher, though, the meaning of interpreting, you know, what's the difference between them using this word and that word, but also then nonverbally, there are lots of different things we need to pay attention to and be aware of. We need to step through that, not look through the keyhole of the door, right, but open the door to see the entire picture uh, of interpreting those nonverbals and not just seeing the words, but also seeing those, those different nonverbal attributes that are a part of the, the person sending that message. If you have questions about nonverbal communication or about how it fits into the listening process, please feel free to email me. I'd love to hear from you there. In the meantime, I hope that you will I can begin to account for these nonverbal behaviors as a, as an aspect of listening and specifically as of interpreting 
and listening, trying to use them again to pull in those different context clues. In addition to the, the words that the person is using, what are some different other context clues and nonverbal cues that we can use to identify specifically and more accurately what the meaning is that that person is trying to convey and do that through our interpretation as part of the listening process.